Me, uh, my wife and I, uh, we've been together since we were 14. And uh, uh, back then you can marry at that age. You can't marry at that age now. But uh, we've been together ever since we were 14 years. I saw her in the, in the hallway of the school and I went, hmm. And the love bug struck. And we've been together ever since. So we've been together, I don't know how to calculate all that, I don't really want to, I think it's 54 years, but legally we've been together for 41. So y'all supposed to laugh at that. <laughs> but I learned some good business principles uh, from our life together with Donna. When she got pregnant, I had an ice cream shop. So we used to go to the Lamaze class now, this is back when it first started, and very few men were in the class. And I was there rubbing her stomach <laughs> and all that. And uh, all the pregnant women found out I, that I owned a ice cream shop. And I mean, they were, it was like a magnet. <laughs> and, and I learned the principle that if you, got, if you have a product for a niche, you're going to be successful. So I became the most popular guy there at the Lamaze class. They'd all get on the elevator with me. <laughs> well, the message today is everything you need is in the house. Now, house, let me define that. It, it's not only a physical building. It's also your resources, your relationships, such as your families, your ancestors, your church. Church family, right? See, we need to wake up. I'm speaking to the, you know, those that are watching us uh, on, on live on YouTube. As a church across this nation, we need to wake up and realize who we are in Christ. We're not weaklings. We're not, you know... I, I'm not joining a club. This is a living organism that the Spirit of God is in the midst of it. He has established this. And when we wake up and realize our potential and our capacity of what we can achieve and what we can do and realize the gifts that we have around us, our mentors, uh, the sphere of influence that we have, your knowledge, your dreams, your character, your faith. The, this is what I define as a house. It's not a physical building. And you know the, the scripture, one man built his house on sand, another built his house on rock. And so the sand to me uh, represents, there's no, you know, there's this shifting sands, relationships, all this. There's no purpose in life. There's, there's no direction in life. And we know what happened. Said when the storm came, the house that was built on sand, it crumbled. But if we build our house on solid rock, in this, in this analogy in the scriptures, it's Jesus Christ, which means being relational, having a purpose. See, as Christians, we have a purpose. We ought to be, you know, and this is something you can't conjure up. It has to come from within. And there's a discovery within in you of realizing who you are in Christ. And when, you, you know, when, you, when that, is, that is discovered, then all the excuse making goes out the window. All the criticism goes out the window. All the name blaming goes out the window. Because you, you now realize who you are in Christ and you've been created uniquely for him and for others. I want to make some points of clarification. One of them is this, me defining that house. The subtitle of this is don't miss your opportunity. Let me define what opportunity is. Connections. You're valuable. And the connections that you have those divine appointments with, with God, if we will seize them, 
You know, there's a Latin word, carpe diem, it means to seize the day. You know, when we seize the day and we seize our relationships and don't take them for granted, it's amazing how our outlook on life can change. The word motivation is another. I want to clarify, you can write this down, I'm getting, this is for free. I normally charge $1,500 for a motivational class, leadership class. But motivation comes from a Latin word, movari. And that means to agitate, to stir up, to push forward. It means to give a thrust in where we're at. It doesn't matter what age you're at. It doesn't matter what your circumstance is. It doesn't matter what you're going through. Every one of us sitting in this room at various and sundry times, we need a thrust. I love that story about Caleb when it came time to disperse the, the property and the land and Joshua was doing it and Joshua gave Caleb. So these two men had a different spirit. The rest of them missed it. Caleb and Joshua, it says in scripture they had a different spirit. In other, word, in other words, they saw the victory. They saw ahead. They had a vision. They understood what was going on. So when it came time to disperse of the land and Joshua went to Caleb and said, Caleb, here's your land. It's down here in this valley. It was the plush land, the fer fertile land. He was rewarding him for his faithfulness. He was rewarding him for all the achievements and standing with him and so forth. You know, God's going to reward you too because many of you in here have been standing. Are you, are you listening to me? But it's amazing about Caleb. I love this guy in the scripture. He was 88 years of age. And he told Joshua, no, I don't want that plush land down there. I want that mountaintop because I'm going to go kill those Anakites. Because they messed up his family. He had a point to prove. 80 years old, he's still going to go fight. I don't care where you're at, your economic condition, whatever age it is. Let me tell you something. The spirit can be stirred up in you to go and conquer. You can conquer. Amen. To thrust. There was an African man, farmer, in Africa, of course, and he had about four or five hundred acres down there, and you know, he was tending, you know, animals and goats and had an orchard and these kinds of things. And, but he heard that other African farmers were discovering uh, diamonds in the continent of Africa. So the bug got him. Now he got motivated. Now I'm bringing out a point. See, motivation could be directed that's going to bring a benefit and fruit. And motivation also can stir you up to do something that is dead. It's not going to bring any fruit. So there's good motivation, there's bad motivation. Would y'all agree with me on that? So when he found this out, he, the bug got him, he said, I'm going to sell my farm, go look for some diamonds. So he sold his farm, went out looking for diamonds, never found any diamonds. The man that he sold the farm to, he's out surveying his land one day and he was by a creek. He looked down and saw something shiny in the river. It was about ankle deep. He went down there and picked it up. It was a big stone. Took it home, put it on his mantle. Three weeks later, a friend came and saw the rock on the mantle. He said, what do you got there? He said, well, it's a crystal. Guy went over and picked it up and was looking at it. He said, I don't believe this is a crystal. I think this is a diamond. I think this is probably the largest diamond in Africa. So they argued. You know, because the farmer who found it, he said, no, nah, it's just a crystal. He said, no, let's go check it out. So they went to a gemologist and they had it checked out. It ended up being the largest diamond in, found in Africa. The farmer said to his friend, I've got a lot of these in the river. Everything you need is in the house. 
of these things I just mentioned and, and clarified, your family, your resources, your relationships, your dreams, your character. These are, these are things that are in your house, the diamonds that are in your house. They need to be discovered. You need to awaken, you need to awaken yourself, all of us. I'm talking about me too. I've got a thousand, over a thousand stories residing in my spirit because I read them all the time. For the last 32 years, that's what I've done. My wife knows this because she'll read stories to me and I'll read stories to her. It's our habit almost every morning we wake up and we read an inspirational story to one another. And we'll pray. And I don't even know, you know, I can't, it's not like a, a Rolodex where I can pull up each spirit, each uh, inspirational story. But I know they're resided in there, and here's why. Because at various times when I need encouragement, that story, a story will pop up and give me encouragement. The diamonds that we have is right in your own house. And like the, the farmer that was motivated to go out elsewhere, he didn't study about diamonds. He didn't look, he didn't, he didn't know that much about diamonds, but he's going to go find some diamonds. There's a process. And this farmer, I'm sure, after he found out the farm that he sold, it was the largest mine, diamond mine, in all of the continent of, Eric, of, America, of Africa. He probably wanted to commit Harry Carey. <laughs> See, you need to be motivated, but you need to be motivated in a process. If you understand what I'm saying. So, I've got thousands of biographies in my spirit that I've read. That's all I do. I, that's my forte and my, my degrees and everything. It's all in about leadership because leadership is supposed to lead. And hopefully somebody's following. <laughs> but we need these things. We need these encouragements. So this diamond story. Now I'm going to ask y'all a question. I'm going to pull you in, hopefully. Some of y'all might be going, man, I can't wait until this thing ends. I can get out of here. But I'm going to try to pull you in. I'm going to ask y'all a question. How many in here have gotten a, on an airplane and flown somewhere? Let me see your hands. That's pretty much everybody. Now let me ask you another question. Barring some unfortunate event like getting Montezuma's revenge or something like that that happened to me in Mexico, I still caught my flight, by the way. I put the pins on and I made it. I really did. I wouldn't stand in Mexico another day, not another day. I had all the Montezuma's revenge that I wanted. And so I made it back, man. I, kept my, I caught my flight. Let me ask you a question. Barring some unfortunate event, you know, like a weather storm, snow, or something like that, how many of you missed your flight? What was the reason? Why did you miss your flight? Was it because of you? Did you oversleep? Yeah. No, I'm talking about un not other events that you can't control. Not the, not the airlines, not, you know, you're driving there and you have a flat tire. You can't control things like that. I'm saying things that you control, not outside things, because all of us are subject to missing a plane because of that. But I've asked this question a lot of times, and it comes down, nobody's missed a flight in the sense that it, uh, in terms of outside of outside control. Sometimes things outside of our control happens and we can't make the flight. Let me ask you a question, why? Why is it that you got there and got on that plane? Somebody give me an answer. Going else. Well, I know you're going somewhere else. That's why you're getting on a plane, man. But, but, but what made you get there on time? You, all right. You spent some money for a ticket, right? Non-refundable. 
Commitment. Excited about going on a trip. There you go. Destination. Planned ahead. Say again. My pastor. What? Oh, motivating you. Okay. You and I need to have a talk later. I, you need. All right. I mean, I've been on a lot of flights going to different parts of the country, and there are, it's always an adventure, believe me. And y'all know that too. Well, the reason why is because we bought the tickets. We're not going to waste that money. Also, we're going to get on a plane and go to a destination that we have planned. Second of all, the night before, you'll pack all your stuff. You'll go over it again. My wife will come in and go over it again. And we'll, we'll go over it maybe three or four times. Make sure I got everything. Then we get to bed at 4 o'clock. And the flight's leaving at 7. So I get 30 minutes sleep or whatever, and then we get up and we go to the airport. And I have never missed a flight that was in my control. The airplane is an analogy for opportunity. An opportunity means a connection, just like that airplane. You're going to a connection. You're meeting a connection. And that airplane has a destination. You can't go to Chicago and L.A. at the same time. you gotta, you got to make a choice. And indecisiveness will never get you the motivation, the thrust that you need to get to where your destination is. Are you with me? Does that make sense? Yeah. Turn to Luke 15, 11. And if you don't have a Bible, I encourage you as a bishop to get one electronically or paper or whatever. It's the most inspirational book that I know of most instructional book that I know of. And you can find so many gems and principles in there for life. And believe me, uh, all of it is needed. Then he said, a certain man had two sons. Now, a lot of people say this is the story of the prodigal son. Uh, I, I like to say it's the tale of two sons. So a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of the goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. Now he asked, normally in the Jewish culture, you didn't receive your livelihood or your portion of your livelihood of your inheritance from your father until he died. That was customary. So the timing wasn't right. Say, timing. See, your opportunity is on schedule. See, that flight of opportunity is going to leave you if you don't get there at the airport on time. Because opportunities don't always come by. Thank God they do, but, you know, they will come again. But you can't, you're not, you know, the reason why we get to the airport to catch a plane and get on the flight because we have disciplined ourselves. We have planned. We know where we're going. We know what we are going to do. And it's the same way here. You know, the plane of opportunity. The, it's going to leave the airport. Right? They're not going to sit there and wait on you. Oh, man, I overslept. Man, I was tired. Man, I partied all night. They don't care. Opportunities don't care. Are you with me? And not many days after. In other words, the young man didn't leave immediately. We don't know how many days. Some commentaries say that he really thought about it, if he should do it, if he should leave with and depart with his inheritance. It's, you know, kind of conjecture. We really don't know. But he didn't leave immediately. The younger, after some days, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country. You know, a far country here represents a lot of things, but one of them is 
you have left the place of your house where all of the diamonds that you need, you have left that. Here's the young man, he's got an inheritance and he leaves, he's thinking he's got everything, he's got nothing. Because he left the house of opportunity. He left the house where the diamonds were at. He left the house and didn't see the value what was in the house. You got to see the value that's in your house. Is this making sense to you? I, we're drawing on stuff. Uh, I think earlier we had Pastor Buddy up there, my spiritual father. He died last year. This time. That's okay. But this is Father's Day. He's my spiritual father. I was going through the photo album and looking at my spiritual father, and I just started crying because he meant so much to me. I mean, you don't know. I mean, he really meant so much to me. Because when I came to the Lord, I was, I was one messed up hombre. I really was. I was messed up. But because of his guidance and me listening you know, opportunities is where you have a hunger. You know, Buddy didn't have to come after me. I went after Buddy. You know, you know and let me tell you something. You retain things when you're hungry and you go after it. If somebody's got to come to you, most of the time you'll forget it. Because the hunger to learn and to know and get gems, diamonds in your life that's in your house you just kind of take it for granted. That's not too hard, is it? So to get journeyed to a far country, there wasted his possessions with reckless living. Your translation might say prodigal. Prodigal means reckless. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in the land and he began to be in one. You know, when, when you leave your house and your motivation that's thrusting you forward is for selfishness and for fame and for pride and all these things, you're going to think you're in a famine at the end because everybody's going to abandon you. We gladly feel this, uh, have filled his stomach with the pods of the swine and eat, which was repugnant to a Jew. But here he is in a pig pen eating pods. I'm going to raise my hand. You don't have to. I've been in the pig pen. I know what the pig slop is like. I wrestled with it for years until God came and ministered to me and delivered me from that pig pen. Just like many of you. And by the way, you don't have to stay in the condition you're in. God's big enough, powerful enough to do everything. All you got to do is submit and repent to him and come to him. And here's interesting. No one gave him anything. Here he is spending his money lavishly on everybody, being a big shot, having a big party. We go party tonight, man. And then it comes to where it's a you know, famine because nobody would give him anything after that. But when he came to himself, woo! Let's read, I mean, let's read that again. When he came to himself. That's the key. That's the thesis statement in the whole parable here of the lost son or the prodigal son. He came to himself. Say, came to myself. That is a very powerful thing. When you wake up and come to yourself and say, I'm not living this way no more. I can get better treatment in my father's house. Even if I'm a servant there, I'll get treated better. But when he came to himself, some translation says, when he came to his reason, when he reasoned, came to his senses. How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to, and to spare? And I per perished with the hunger. I've been in a pig pen. I woke up and went, what am I doing here? I will arise and go to my father's house. See, there's action, motivation, 
So, so the motivation now is in the reverse. He's getting thrust now, and he's going in, in the opposite direction. He's going back. He left his father's house. Now he's going back. And I think we'd all agree that his opportunity had came when he reasoned with himself. See, when you reason with yourself, opportunity shows up. That's your connection. See, when you come to yourself and you go, you got resources out here waiting on you that come like the speed of light as you make up your mind where you're, no, where you're going. And all these divine connections will come to you. I mean, everything that you need, it will assist you in where you need to go. We're no different, individually and corporately. I'm an individual, but I know I'm connected with the body of Christ. Not superficially. I'm connected with my heart. We have a lot of silly sayings in the body of Christ. Yeah, somebody do something. That's not my gifting. Oh, come on, please. First seven years when I came into the kingdom of God, I cleaned toilet bowls. I went in every, Dave knows. I'd go in, I had, I named them. I used to talk to them when I'd go in there. Had one that was bubbles. And they never could, we never could correct it. Look, I, I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it all my heart, and I, you know, I just thought, you know, the, the pastor at that time asked me if I would do this. And I said, yes. Why? Because I've been redeemed. And I, I've been forgiven so much. How can I say, that's not my gifting? No, it's my commitment. I would mop the floors. I would make coffee. And I would put out chairs and set them out. I'd have them even with a string. I mean, everything I did, I was doing it for the Lord and I was doing it with excellence. When you walk down there, you could see the rolls of chairs perfectly aligned. The coffee, well, it was army coffee, so probably not too good, but. And I'd clean those toilet, toilet bowls. And I'll tell you what, everybody went in there, I took pride because I knew they were going to be clean. Floors mopped in there. I did that for seven years and never opened my mouth. And it was the best training for leadership I ever went through. Not my gifting. Come on. I'm going to get back, come back around to that here in a minute. But Donna, during that seven years, she did the nursery for seven years. To whom much has been forgiven... Much is required. We did it with joy. We were glad. I mean, we were so messed up in, in the pig pen together. When we, got, when we got gloriously saved, we put it, we didn't, we didn't kind of, we put it on the floor, man, the gas paddle. And my spiritual father, I had a night job at that time. During the day, I would drive out and I would paint his house, I would mow his grass, and we would have lunch together. And I did this for one reason. I wanted to get the wisdom that he had. I never had a mentor in my life. I never had a father in my life in the sense of teaching me and mentoring me. I'm stupid, but I'm not dumb. I knew I needed to have somebody with some sense because I knew I didn't have any. Are you with me? Is this too hard? Or And so I, we'd sit on that front porch with Pastor Buddy and Carolyn would bring out tuna fish sandwiches and stuff like that. And I'd talk to him. We'd have an hour break there. And I got so much wisdom and gems from him. It, didn't, it, wasn't, it wasn't laborious for me. I did it with joy. This man led me to the Lord. This man had the wisdom. This man was, I'll tell you, that's why I was crying because I have never met anybody as humble as my spiritual father. He really cared. And he arose and came to his father's house. 
That means he's, he's going. He came to himself, came to his senses. He realizes, wait a minute, just like we said, and he went to his father's house. But when he was still a great way off, a great way off, he wasn't close. He was a great way off. His father saw him and had compassion. He ran. The father ran. And this, this, this part here really, I mean, just tears me up. And fell on his neck. And kissed him. Some translation says that he wept. The father wept. He was so, you know, the, the whole imagery here of the, this parable, the picture here, is that the father had been waiting on him and waiting on him and waiting on him. Then when he saw him afar off, he went after him. Amen. How many of us would have done that with our daughter or our son and, and be that kind? That merciful. Let's be honest with ourselves. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Boom. They don't need any explanation. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe, put it on him, put a ring in his hand, sandals on his feet, and bring the fatted calf here, and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this, my son was dead. He is alive again. Amen. See, when you come to your senses, and you got the motivation to make things right, and go back to your house, where everything you need is in the house, whoo! God will restore what the canker worm is eating. And that's what he did right here. Restored him that quick. Now his elder son, tell of two sons. His, by the way, the elder son was in the pig pen too. His self-righteousness. Just a different pig pen, still a pig pen. Moral superiority. It's all about morals, doing right and wrong. That's one part of it. It's not the whole picture. And as he came near, drew near to the house, he heard the music and dancing, so he called one of the servants and asked, what, is, what, what, these, what do these things uh, mean? He said to him, your brother has come and because he has received him is safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. But he was hungry and would not go in. Therefore his father came out, this is the older son, and pleaded with him. See, the older son never did come to his senses. He just in a different pig pen. You know, I you know I can take it or leave it. You know, you know, God knows where I'm sitting at. I, you know, what do I? I don't need to move. You don't understand principles about change. Change doesn't happen while you're sitting there. Change doesn't happen while you, in your own mind, you're saying things like, "Well, God knows where I'm at. He can come to me if He wants to." That's pride. Draw near unto me and I'll draw near unto you. Can I get an amen from somebody? So he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I've been serving you, I've never transgressed your commandment at any time. Boy, he thought he was hot stuff. And yet you never gave me a young goat that I might have make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours came who has devoured your livelihood with harlots and killed, you kill the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, son, you're always with me. See, never, see the, never saw the diamonds in the house. Never saw the opportunities in the house. 
Never broke a commandment. But yet he's still hard. And he said to him, son, you're always with me. And all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make Mary and be glad. For your brother was dead and is, is alive again and was lost and now is found. See, his older brother, if he would have saw the value, the opportunities of his house, he would have been rejoicing with his father. Isn't that... Let me ask you, I've got a brother that was lost. He's found now. I didn't sit around and go, man. Wouldn't you be glad that if your, your brother or your sister got, came back to the Lord? Sure you would. I hope you would. But also we'd put some caveats on it, wouldn't we? Well, we're glad you slept slower, but, you know, have you been out there? What you been doing? You know that's wrong, don't you? No, we got to put our flesh in there. We got to get our bite in the flesh and tear it out of people. That's not the gospel. So, uh, conclusion. I got much more to say, but for the sake of time, I will not. But here's the conclusion. Turn to Philippians 4.13. We'll wrap this up in the next 10 minutes. Philippians 4, 13. I can do all things. Let's say it together. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, either that is a truth or it's a lie. It's not a lie, but here's the truth. We don't believe it sometimes. We can believe it for you or you, but do I believe it for me? I can do. It didn't say it's easy. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That word do, you know what that means? To give birth. Literally, it means to give birth. That's why I was talking about Donna in the Lamaze class and all that. You know, I was with Donna in the hospital and she was giving birth to Crystal and uh, I'll just be honest with you, I was out of my element. I didn't know what was going on. <laughs> but I was afraid and excited at the same time. I didn't have a clue what was happening. But I, I soaked it all in. So I got to see Crystal come out of the uh, birth, and uh, I got to hold her in my arms. She's been in my arms ever since. I can do all things, do, to birth. All things. That means you got to go. And you're going, the revelation of where you're going and the direction might change because of the revelation coming to you. See, everything is sitting out here waiting on us. But you can, if you're stagnant, it's not coming to you. But once you make up your mind and you start the doing, you might not know everything at the moment. You've planned the best you can. Your strategy is planned. You just need to know you need to go. And in your going, a lot of resources will come to you that you don't know. Let me give you an example. I think it was 1987 or 88 or something like that. I had a business. I was the CEO of, of this business. It's called Deferred Data Systems. We had all the state uh, offices in the state of Texas and Southland Corporation, which is 7-Eleven, and many, many, many other uh, businesses in Austin. And we were a small cap. We were, uh, actually what we were doing, we were preparing to go on to and be a public traded company on Wall Street. I had some very sophisticated lawyers and strategists that was with me on my, on, you know, at the company. 
And that's what we were working toward. You have a little checklist off with Wall, uh, Wall Street. So you just don't go, but can I be a part of the Can I be? No, you got, you got to have X amount of money in the bank and all kinds of criteria before you, they even consider you. And that's where we were hit. Well, bam, we got hit with a lawsuit. See, when you're moving and you're going, problems are going to come. Don't you understand that? If you're in business, you're a problem solver. You'll never solve anything if you're blaming everybody else about what's going on. Did y'all hear what I said? You got to stop the blame game. Nothing gets healed. Nothing gets reconciled. Nothing gets restored if you're blaming everybody else, criticizing everything. Stop that. That will not solve any problems. You know what a problem is? It's an opportunity. It's, your, it's for your flight. You've got to get on that airplane. You've got to get there and connect, make the connection with your airplane when you have a problem. A problem is an opportunity. Or it can be something that is a crisis that makes you critical. It's your choice. But the airplane is sitting there of opportunity. All we've got to do is get the ticket, get our stuff together and get there on time. It'll take us to our destination. So here I'm slapped with a uh, pretty hefty lawsuit in the hundreds of thousands. I didn't know what I was going to do. We didn't have the money. You know, cash flow is king. With the state, we were making over a million. We were making millions. But how many of you know the state doesn't like to pay on time? They don't. And cash flow is what keeps everything alive. You can, on your paper, which we did, we look very healthy. But if accounts receivables are not coming in, <laughs> you business people know what I'm talking about. You can look great on paper, but that's, where's your cash flow? So we had a dilemma. And I started praying, interceding. Everything in the house at that time, it, I, it was there for me. Every problem you have is in your house. And if you don't know this, if you haven't waken up to it yet, I'm also talking about the church. I'm not talking about the church in spiritual terms. Oh, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I'm talking about your relationships. So I went, as usual, and I went to the church to go clean out them toilet bowls, happy and grumpy and bubbles. <laughs> what I've been doing, you got, see, when you have a problem, you got to keep moving. Because in your moving, creativity comes to you and innovation comes to you to solve problems. You don't get paralyzed by that. You got to move in order to get the innovation and the creativity to see what's going on. You got to get some advice from some people that you trust as confidants. Because it might be that that problem that you have is an opportunity to change your business model to make it even better to help you go even further. You can't look at problems as, oh my God. Listen, problems are going to be here. It's, it's how we handle them. So I went and did my thing like I was doing every Sunday and clean the toilet bowls, make coffee and all that. There was a gentleman there, never seen him before. I introduced myself. His name was David Starr. S-T-A-R-R. -R. I didn't know who he was. He was a guest, never saw him. He was there to get some uh, marriage counseling from Pastor Buddy at the time. So we got to talking, he asked me what I did. I told him, you know, I had have a company and told him what I was going through. You know, and uh, I told him, you know, I had a lawsuit and all this kind of stuff and I went on, you know, he he asked me, I told him. He gave me his card and he said, "Come down and visit me at Bank 1." You know, he said the address is on the card. Come down and visit me and bring all your paperwork. So I looked on there, it was David Starr, attorney at law. See, when you move, when you move, the diamonds that are in the house are there to come and help you resolve your problems. Now, you don't have to believe it. That's the beautiful thing about the kingdom of God. 
There's a little word that's very powerful. Let me, let me tell you what it is. It's called you get to choose. Choice. Choose this day. Say so you got a problem, you can choose. Boy, y'all are awful quiet. You're either tired or you don't want to listen to me anymore. You're thinking? Burning the wood? We're going somewhere. So I went down there visiting. Got there. I thought, you know, I thought he was he was treating me like royalty. They had the whole upper floor of this bank one building down in Austin on uh, 6th Street, I think it was. So he took me around, all the way around the deal, he introduced me to secretaries, and you know, I thought I was some big shot celebrity or something, you know. And he was introducing me to all the other lawyers. Went, went, went all the way around, took about an hour. We get back to his office and he said, well, give me, your, give me the paperwork you got. And he looking at it. He said, I'll take care of this. And I'll do it for pro bono. I said, pro bono, what's that? He said, free. I said, I know that word. And it just so happened, David Starr, they had the largest law firm in the state of Texas. And the law firm that was suing me was the floor below him. The guy that signed it, David Starr told me this. He said, the guy that signed this, he owns me a favor. Don't worry about it. I'll take care of it. Everything you need is in the house. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But to do means I've got to give birth. I've got to go. I've got to go to my destination. I can't be paralyzed. I can't sit back and blame this, blame that, all this, all that. No, get up, rise up above that pettiness and get your juices creating and get your innovation going because from that problem, something better can come out. Yes. Something better will assist you. you you're, it's amazing what happens when you have some competition. <laughs> so three weeks went by. I went back down there to see this lawyer. Walked in and he said, how about... Uh, $5,000, can you pay $5,000? I said, I can do it today. So it went from 200 and something thousand down to 5,000. God, God is the biggest diamond in our house. If you understand what I'm saying. But in your going, that's when your divine appointments come. That's when your creativity, that's when your innovation happens. It's in your going. I like the last part of this verse. Through Christ, who strengthens me. Well, I want to tell you how he strengthens us. Just that story I just told you. When I met that lawyer, that was a di divine appointment that God set up. When I left that office from having two hundred something thousand dollars down to five thousand, I'm gonna tell you something. I, I I gained an inch in height. In other words, you get strengthened from having confidence. Yes. That's why he put in there, I can do all things. That means overcoming things. We're overcomers. Christ said we're more than overcomers. More than. So we, 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 we reduce that down to, well, I'm overcoming myself, my sin. I'm not saying, I'm not making light of that. I'm, did this, does this say all things? It means all things. Every, every challenge, every problem, everything that we have. See, everything that we need for what we need to do in this community and for one another and to make a mark. I'm talking about making a mark for Christ. Is right here, us, in this house. Do you believe? That's the, that's the question. Do we believe 
Now, we say these things, right? I mean, we say all the Christian phraseology, but do we really believe it? We got to give birth. We need to thrust. And we need to catch our plane of opportunity. Don't let a problem get you to, in the blame game because that's not healthy. All right, I got a problem, God. I know you're going to give me the answer. I'm, going, I'm doing, I'm going to go, I'm going to give birth. I don't know exactly how it's going to turn out, but I know one thing. You're going to give me a divine appointment. I'll close with this. I like uh, anecdotal uh, stories. Christ uses them quite often. This is a true story. Uh, we know him very well. He's a dear friend of ours in the church, been a dear friend of mine. Dave knows him. His name is Irvin Rutherford. And he was a missionary to uh, Malaysia. So he likes to drink orange juice. And so God, God knows See, we 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 got to get an understanding that God knows us. He loves us. He rewards us. How does He reward us from our going? And so He was leaving to go over to Asia on an island that was an unreached people group. And we got an un <laughs> we got an unreached people group in in this country called the Millennials. Different story. But anyway, so Irvin gets, get, goes down to uh, the grocery store. There is hundreds of cases of these canned orange juices. He picks a six-pack out of one case randomly. He goes over and checks out. He takes us with him on his flight. He gets over there to Malaysia on the island. He makes contact with these unreached people group. He could speak the language. He went to UT, ended up learning the language very well, very fluently. So he didn't need an interpreter. He went there and started talking to him about Christ. When, they got, when he got to the point that they nailed him to the cross, they didn't have a word in their language for nail. Because everything they did, they did it with bamboo and wrapping it and stuff like that. They, didn't, they never seen a nail. They never heard of a nail. So he got stumped. And so the, you know, the chief and the tribe, the tribal leaders, they were like, so, 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 so. and so what, what he was saying was, we stop here. So he was depressed, Irvin, he was depressed, took his orange juice and went down to the bank of the river. He set his orange juice in the river because it was a real cold spring. And he's sitting there praying, asking God, God, you got to show me how to uh, show them what a nail is. Because he already tried and they just couldn't understand it. So he reaches down. Remember, one six pack out of hundreds of, uh, out of, of, out of, hundreds of uh, cases of orange juice. He picks out this six pack and goes to Malaysia, puts it in the river. Now he's got six of them there in the river. He picks out the one of the six and he pops it, and he starts drinking it, and he's, he, he hears a rattling. And he's trying to figure out what that is, so he poured out the orange juice, and a nail fell out. I don't know, it might not excite you, but that's how meticulous, I'm serious, this is how meticulous, tailor fit that God is. That's how meticulous and tailor fit God is. And he took the nail, went back to the tribal leaders, showed them the nail, and, and, and had it in his hand. Then they got the connection. Yes. The opportunity came. And he led the whole tribe to the Lord. Amen. Don't get excited. I'll shout myself. Yes. All right, I'm going to close with this. No, I'm just joking with you. All right, took too much of your time. Four after 12. I apologize for going a little bit long. But be motivated. Don't miss your opportunity. And remember, 
Everything you need is in the house. Everything you need. Let's close in prayer. Father, I thank you for your, your oversight, your love, and your mercy. You're so kind. You're so generous. We thank you so much. We thank you for your son who came and died for our sins. Jesus, we, we exalt you, and rightly so. Holy Spirit, we thank you for being here to lead us, teach us, correct us, discipline us, encouraging us. Holy Spirit, we thank you for that. Come. Come, Holy Spirit. Amen. Yeah. Father's Day. Yeah. Y'all be blessed. Have a blessed day. Happy Father's Day.